Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Benadryl or diphenhydramine. This is one of the original antihistamines. It's an H1 antihistamine, a first generation drug, not to be confused with the second generation H1 antihistamines. Those are drugs like Claritin and Allegra and Zyrtec or their generic equivalents. Benadryl or diphenhydramine is still the 210th most prescribed medicine, two million prescriptions written every year for the drug, but that's only a small percentage of the total use because it's available over the counter in a variety of capsules and tablets and elixirs and sprays and creams and gels. It's also available for use intramuscularly as an injection or intravenously. Now in the first generation antihistamine family, there are a large number of medicines, over 40 different kinds. And diphenhydramine is certainly one of the most popular. That would be Benadryl or Nitol. But closely related to it, we have other kinds of medicines. We have doxylamine. Doxylamine is what we find in Unisom or Zequil or NyQuil. Then we have Chlortrimethon and Dimethane, and we have Tavist, a series of medicines. And they're not only sold by themselves, they're often sold in combination with other drugs. So you might find them in your cold or cough syrup. You might find them in your sleeping pill. You might find them in your Alka-Seltzer Plus. And oftentimes, you can take so many that you might actually find yourself in a level where you're approaching toxicity. Because if you take it in an over-the-counter cold medicine, maybe you take it as a sleeping pill, maybe you take it again as an allergy pill, all of a sudden that sort of adds up. So, where is the use for the antihistamines? Where is the use for Benadryl? Well, it's used to treat allergies, of course. It's used to treat insomnia. It's used to treat some of the tremors in Parkinson's disease or the extrapyramidal symptoms that you could get either in Parkinson's disease or from taking doses of antipsychotics, drugs that are now used to treat schizophrenia, used to treat bipolar disorder. They're also used to treat nausea and itchiness and motion sickness, and very frequently used to treat the common cold. But we've known since 1955 when the U.S. Army Medical Corps did some research on the antihistamines, on Benadryl, that it really doesn't work. It's no more helpful than a placebo for the common cold. It's the most frequently used in hospital, in the emergency room, medicine when people have anaphylactic reactions they get a shot of epinephrine, they get a shot of the Benadryl. First generation medicines are used not only for insomnia, they're also used for preoperative sedation, sometimes as antiemetics, sometimes for the serotonin syndrome, anxiety. Sometimes they're used even for people with migraine headache, but there's no evidence, even though they're taken very frequently for the cold, there's no evidence that they're helpful in upper respiratory infections or otitis media, ear infections, or sinusitis, or nasal polyps, or just nonspecific nasopharyngeal symptoms. If you're going to take the medicine, the general dose would be 25 to 50 milligrams every four to six hours as needed. Maximum dose in any 24-hour period should be 300 milligrams. If you're taking it for insomnia, 25 milligram to 50 milligram, taken about 30 minutes before bedtime seems to be the most popular dose. If you're taking it for allergies, either seasonal or perennial allergies, that's allergic rhinitis, runny nose, or allergic conjunctivitis, itchy eyes, or urticaria, well, you might find that it doesn't really give you complete relief of the symptoms because they're antihistamines, but the symptoms might be due to a variety of other kind of chemicals that your body releases. And, as a matter of fact, if you're taking them for a runny nose, you'll find that they're not all that effective. You could find an intranasal antihistamine prescription that is much more effective and works much more quickly. It takes a couple hours for the Benadryl to work, but if you use a spray containing an antihistamine, well, that could work in 15 minutes. Same thing when you're talking about itchy eyes. If you have itchy eyes, yes, you could take the Benadryl. That's going to take a long time to work, but you could use other kind of medicines that contain antihistamines like Visine or now Patidae is available over the counter. Antihistamine, but not in the Benadryl family. Well, how about urticaria? Urticaria 
Again, widely used Benadryl, and it seems to be quite helpful for some people, but it's not a complete cure because, again, there are other chemicals other than histamine that are associated with urticaria. So you divide urticaria into two families. The acute urticaria lasts for less than six weeks, tends to go away with almost any of the antihistamines, tends to improve quite nicely, but it's the chronic urticaria, the urticaria that lasts for more than six weeks, oftentimes up to several years, that we have problems with. And for them, for those individuals, it seems like the Benadryl by itself probably isn't going to be sufficient. So oftentimes we add another antihistamine, a different family, or we add an H2 antihistamine, that would be a drug like cimetidine. For atopic itchiness, well, the antihistamines, again, are somewhat effective, but remember, it's an H1 antihistamine. There are several different types of histamine receptors, so the H1 antihistamines don't work on the H2, H3, H4, receptors, and as a result, uh, the likelihood of atopic itch going away is a little bit, but not complete. Now, if you want to take the drug because you're allergic to something and you might get some allergic reaction in your chest, bronchospasm, well, Benadryl doesn't seem to work for exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, but it does seem to work if you premedicate yourself against the allergic type bronchospasm. For anaphylaxis, not very effective. If you take the pill, it takes a couple hours to work, but if you have anaphylaxis, you need the medicine right now, so that's a shot of epinephrine. It could be used as an antiemetic, sedative, or analgesic before you have an operation. It can be used to treat motion sickness and vertigo, but interestingly, since it needs to get into the central nervous system for that, this is where the other kind of antihistamines, the second generation drugs, don't work because they don't really get into the brain. So if you have motion sickness or if you have vertigo, chances are you're not going to get any relief from taking an Allegro or taking a Zyrtec or taking a Claritin. Well, that brings up the whole idea about crossing the brain barrier. So yes, indeed, it gets into the brain and that's why it's used as a sleeping pill. So the H1, the first generation antihistamines, get into the brain and they make you sleep, but they ruin your sleep architecture. And that's part of the reason why the military and commercial pilots are not allowed to use Benadryl. They can use a different kind of antihistamine. They can use the fexofenadine, which is the same kind of drug as Allegra, but not the Benadryl. Well, commonly used as sleep aids, we've talked about that, the Nitol or the Unisom or the Zequil, Tylenol PM, Advil PM. Sometimes parents even use the drugs to sedate children when they're going on long airline trips, but that's kind of frowned upon by both the doctors and the airlines because that means that the children, if there was an emergency, then the children would not be able to respond. Well, as a matter of fact, the antihistamines are probably the most widely used sleeping pills far in excess of the benzodiazepines. The sedation, well, it sort of ruins the REM sleep, but we find as many as 8% of senior citizens may be taking drugs like Benadryl to help them sleep. Unfortunately, when you take the Benadryl, you're going to rapidly become tolerant to the sedative effect, but some of the other effects like memory impairment, next day problems with driving a car, or the dry mouth, or the pupil dilation, or urinary retention, or constipation, that's going to go on. So it seems that, especially for seniors, it's probably a good idea not to take these kind of antihistamines. Side effects of the antihistamines? Yeah, there are actually plenty. You can develop the tolerance, like I say. You can develop an antihistamine hangover that means that the day after you take the antihistamine, you might be a little bit dopey or groggy. You might have some difficulty remembering. You might have some difficulty driving the car. Well, the antihistamines of choice, if you happen to have allergic rhinitis or allergic conjunctivitis or you have urticaria or you have itch, probably going to be the second generation 
H1 antihistamine. So it's probably a better idea that you take a drug like cimetid, like, like uh, liratidine or Allegra or Zyrtec. Those seem to be much safer and better tolerated. Well, the first generation and the second generation seem to be about equally effective but none of those drugs seem to be as effective as the inhaled nasal corticosteroids. Corticosteroids seem to be much more effective. They work much more quickly than the antihistamines, and they don't have the central nervous system effects. Now, histamine is made from an amino acid known as histidine, and it's altered by an enzyme in the body known as histidine decarboxylase, and it's present in a whole bunch of different areas. Histamine has at least four receptors that we know of. The H1 receptor is important in neurotransmission, and it's an anticonvulsant. The chemical acts on sleep, it acts as a cognitive uh, arena, it acts in the area of memory. So the histamine is extremely important, and when we block it, we do so at our own peril sometime. Now the histamine is released from mast cells and basophils. The receptors happen to be in the respiratory smooth muscle, the vascular endothelial cells, the gastrointestinal tract, the heart tissues, the brain, and of course in the immune systems the, throughout the body. Well, if we engineer a mouse, not to have the H1 receptors, that mouse is going to have deficient immune system. So since the Benadryl or diphenhydramine came on the market before the FDA required extensive evaluation, we really don't have good information about the absorption and the distribution and the metabolism and the elimination. We don't even have good information on how it works in children, how it works in elderly individuals or in people who have kidney disease or with other kinds of drugs. But Benadryl itself seems, once you take it, has about a 40 to 60 percent bioavailability, gets into the system. Maximum concentration is going to be between one and a half and two hours. The range, the half-life, is going to be anywhere between about two hours and 13 hours. It's about five hours in children, it's about nine hours in young adults, about 13 hours in senior citizens, but a significant variation. Compare that to, say, hydroxyzine that lasts in your body for at least a day, or chlortrimeton, again, it lasts about a day. The action comes on after about two hours if you take an antihistamine, and the duration of the action probably going to be somewhere between six and twelve hours. It's going to be metabolized by being broken down through demethylation and through oxidation. And interestingly, if you happen to have a urine test and you take the Benadryl, it might show up positive for methadone. Well, we can measure the chemical in the blood if there's a reason, if there's a question about toxicity, if there's a question about driving while intoxicated. Pregnancy doesn't seem to harm the fetus. Breastfeeding, it's not recommended. Liver metabolism is the way it seems to go out. You can overdose on the medicine, either purposely or accidentally, and when you overdose on the medicine, euphoria or dysphoria or hallucinations or heart palpitations, extreme dizziness, sometimes tremors or seizures. Some people have abnormal speech and flushed skin. Certainly dryness of the mouth and the throat is common. Sometimes people can vomit, can't urinate can't go to the bathroom, can't have a bowel movement, can get a megacolon. And then some people develop cardiovascular collapse because the diphenhydramine or Benadryl can actually in high doses block the potassium channels and that leads to arrhythmias. So we talk about overdoses as mild, about 60% of the people who overdose, that's less than 300 milligrams or severe. If it happens to be more than 1,000 milligrams, that's when you get the delirium or the seizures or the problems with psychoses. There are many different classes of antihistamines. Both the diphenhydramine, or Benadryl, and the doxylamine, they fit into the ethanolamine family. There are a variety of other families as well. Side effects overall are related to the drowsiness and dizziness and sedation, but then you could get some headache. You could have impairment of your cognitive function, your memory. You could have erectile dysfunction or jitteriness cause visual problems, sometimes irregular breathing, and although it's used in low dose for nausea, high dose can lead to vomiting. 
we talked about the sleep disorders. Well, that can lead to a problem with reduced working memory and impaired sensory neurofunction. And that can lead, in some instances, especially in children, to a paradoxical reaction where they become hyperactive rather than sedated. Now, interestingly, a study was done at Yale University, and what they did is they looked at seniors. Because about 25% of the seniors or more are given an antihistamine while they're in the hospital, so they divided them into two groups. In one group, they didn't get an antihistamine. In the other group, who were equally mentally alert, when they got into the hospital, they were given antihistamines and then they followed those people during the course of hospitalization and found that those people who received the antihistamines had an increased incidence of suffering from delirium or disordered speech or altered consciousness. Well, that's a problem, especially if you happen to be a senior citizen. And as a matter of fact, Benadryl is on the list of what we call the Beers list, B-E-E-R-S list. And that's a list that's compiled for drugs that should not be used in senior citizens. And Benadryl is on there, diphenhydramine. That's because of dilated pupil and dry mouth and dry eyes and the urinary hesitation and the constipation and the hallucinations and delirium and dementia, all of which the drug can cause. Well, it also works on some other neurotransmitters inside the body and can lead to dizziness and hypotension. And for those reasons, Benadryl, diphenhydramine, and many of the first-generation antihistamines, the H1 antihistamine, should be discouraged in senior citizens. The second-generation drugs, those seem to be much safer. So that's the Allegro or the generics or the uh, Liratidine, which is Claritin, or its uh, relatives. Then we have Zyrtec. Of the second-generation H1 antihistamines, Zyrtec is the one most likely to get into the central nervous system and most likely to cause sleepiness. The least likely is the fexofenadine or Allegra with the claritin or loratadine being much closer to the Allegra than it is to the Zyrtec. Well, when did the whole story of antihistamines begin? Not until the 1930s when they were looking actually for an antagonist of acetylcholine. In 1937, the first antihistamine was made, but it was too toxic, so it never made it to market. But diphenhydramine came on the market 1945. It was developed by a researcher at the University of Cincinnati in the Department of Chemical Engineering, of all places. Developed it primary looking at something to relieve muscle spasms. Well, it was the first antihistamine approved by the Food and Drug Administration, and it went over the counter in the 1980s. Now, it just as an interesting side note, in the 1980s, it was found that the drug actually was a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, not a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And with that knowledge, that's where Prozac and all of the other drugs came from, the base of the antihistamines. Now, Again, as just an interesting side note, the drug's illegal in Zaire. So if you happen to be traveling to Zaire, don't have any antihistamine with you. Don't have any Benadryl with you because you'll end up perhaps in jail. They take it very seriously. They think that that drug is horrible. So anyway, that's the story of Benadryl. It's an original first generation H1 antihistamine. And for the most part, we have better medicines available that don't make you sleepy. And for those who are taking the medicine to help them sleep, again, we have better medicines for you because actually the antihistamines that you take to help you sleep are going to interfere with your memory the next day, interfere with your ability to drive the next day, and they're going to interrupt your sleep architecture. And if we're talking about the nasal allergies, again, we have much better medicines. The eye allergies, again, much better medicines than the old-fashioned Benadryl. So if you do happen to be taking some of these drugs, just be careful. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. Consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.